Well, once we've gone through the screening process, and that's what net present value and IRR will do for us, we're ready to choose among all the ones that made it through. Uh, so let's look at how we would select something with NPV, and then we'll look at how we would select something with IRR. With NPV, uh, it's not so easy. Uh, let's take two projects, A and B. The investment required was 10 million for A, 1 million for B. The net present value of both are 200,000. So they're both net present value positive, so they were both they both got a, a an initial accept. Uh, we don't know if we're going to actually do them yet. We still have more analysis to do here. But on a net present value basis, net present value of A equals net present value of B. Now you may say, yeah, but this is 10 million investment. This is 1 million, so 200,000 on 1 million is better. Well, that's not the translation of net present value. Let's not make that mistake. Let's be clear about what's going on here. Both of these projects return their initial investment. So project B returns the, the million and project A returns the 10 million. Both of these projects return the required rate of return. So if it's 20%, project B returns its 20%, project A returns its 20%. And both return another 200,000 up and above that. So we can't just say that, uh, that one is, is uh, better than another on just those measures because from the translation of net present value, they're equal. However, we need a different type of measure to tell us whether or not they're equal. And you'll recall in chapter 12, we looked at how to deal with a constrained resource. When we had a bottleneck in the factory, what we want to do is we want to use that piece of equipment to make the item that provides the highest contribution margin per hour. Not necessarily the highest contribution margin, but the highest contribution margin per hour. Well, we can think of our money as a constrained resource, and what we want to do is provide the highest contribution margin per dollar. So if we look at it that way, we can look at something called the Project Profitability Index, which is just our net present value divided by the investment required. So let's try that for A, and let's try that for B. So our A, our net, our, uh, net present value is 200,000. The investment required is 10 million. So that will give us 2%. B, net present value is 200,000. Investment required is 1 million. And that will give us 20%. So on a project profitability index, we would take B, even though it's only 1 million. The rule for the PPI, the project profitability index, is higher equals better, period. Higher equals better. Now, we could also say that with the net present value. The higher the net present value, the better. But these are identical. But look at the difference in the project profitability index. As far as a constrained resource go, goes, this uh, uh, doing B is a lot better. But let's say that we have uh, $10 million to invest. And there's only these two projects. And we take project one. What do we do with the other nine million? Well, you might say, well, go look for something else. Well, that's great, but what if taking this project provides a bunch of other benefits as well? Net present value doesn't capture that. The project profitability index only breaks a tie, really. So it's we're still, you know, left sort of wondering. So once we do this, we can also look at the internal rate of return and say, well, what about internal rate of return? How does that measure up as a standalone uh, um, analysis? Well. Let's take two projects. They both require an investment of $5,000, but the first one will return $6,000 in one year. If we calculate the IRR on that, we get 20%. The second one requires an investment of $5,000, but returns $1,360 over six years, every year for six years. So if we calculate the internal rate of return on that, we get 16%. But remember now, we said earlier, with the internal rate of return, the higher the better. The higher the better. So if our weighted average cost of capital is 15%, well, we would accept this project, and we would accept this project. But if we had to break a tie between the two, we'd say, well, this one here makes a lot more sense. But there's a bit of a problem here. If we do a net present value analysis on this one, we get to 357. It's net present value positive. And if we do a net present value on this one, we will get to 
592 and obviously we're taking a, a weighted average cost of capital that's far less than 20 percent and far less than 16 percent uh, to get to these numbers well if we do a, prof, a, a project profitability index on the first one we get 7.1 percent and if we take the project profitability index of the second one we get 11.8 percent so look what's going on here this is uh, this is where it causes some confusion if we looked at internal rate of return there we go here's our winner right here now let's take project one if we looked at net present value well here's our winner right here let's take number two if we move forward and calculate a project profitability index for both of them we see that project two is 11.8 versus project one at 7.1 so project two provides a higher profitability index or a higher profitability uh, overall per dollar invested than does project one so looks like project two wins project two wins on net present value alone but sometimes that that doesn't help if we go back up here and let's say this two hundred thousand was actually five hundred thousand this would still only be five percent on the project profitability index this is still twenty percent this one still wins so we want to calculate the PPI because a higher NPV does not necessarily mean a higher PPI but it does in this case it wins however IRR would have said no let's take the other one so we got to be careful when we look at just net present value without looking at the wider picture or we just look at IRR you have to look at IRR and NPV and maybe calculate the PPI for both and then start to make a decision about which one looks better along with wait a minute now do the ones we reject have some intangible amount to it that we can also add on as a sort of a ballpark guess well we think the intangibles would be worth this or that that might push another project higher so it's not just the quantitative side you have to look at it from a number of different facets and in the end guess what it may still be political we'll wrap up this chapter with uh, um, a discussion of two alternative methods of evaluating uh, a project they're rather juvenile and naive uh, one is called the payback method and the other one is called the simple rate of return uh, other than for the smallest businesses uh, I, I really don't recommend them uh, and you'll see why in a minute they're very very naive uh, in a sense uh, that the they're super easy to calculate it doesn't require a lot of thought but they don't really they don't really provide a lot of insight anyways a payback period is the investment required divided by the net annual cash inflows if we have constant cash flows so if we know that we're gonna have the same cash flows year after year this sort of tells us well how long does it take just to pay ourselves back our initial uh, investment but does not make any assumption that a dollar two years from now is any different than a dollar today in other words time has no meaning in the payback period and we know that time has meaning so how serious can you take it right so let's have a look at investment a and investment b uh, uh, project a requires fifteen thousand and will provide five thousand a year uh, project b requires twelve thousand and provides five thousand a year so our pp our payback period in the first case is our investment required is 15 divided by our net annual cash flow 5 uh, which equals 3 and in the second case it's 12 divided by 5 which equals 2.4 so project B uh, we recover or it provides a payback uh, in 2.4 years there's the uh, there's the superior one but all it tells us is how fast we get paid back cash flows may end very very shortly after we get paid back but cash flows on the next one may continue on and on and on and on and on so without taking uh, into consideration the time value of money and the present value of all of it you can make a terrible decision this might have a 10-year life in other words it'll provide five thousand dollars a year for the next 10 years this one might only provide five thousand dollars a year for the next five years so the difference between three thousand dollars an extra three thousand dollars buys you an extra five years at five thousand dollars a year clearly if we did NPV the 10-year life would win so the payback period is you know it's one little thing that you can use but it doesn't provide much uh, uh, in the way of, of good analysis on this one 
Well, let's uh, give an example of what this looks like. Let's say we want to replace a machine and it's going to cost us $80,000 to do that today and we can get $5,000 salvage value for selling that machine. It's going to have an eight year life. After the eight years, it'll have zero operating value. And for those eight years, it'll provide uh, $30,000 a year in incremental cash flow. Now, we have to be careful here uh, how we get to this incremental cash flow. We got to it by um, the new machine will provide some operating income and we add back depreciation from our operating income because depreciation is a non-cash expense. We're told that the operating income with this new machine will increase by $20,000, uh, but it's an $80,000 machine with an eight-year useful life. $80,000 divided by eight is $10,000 on depreciation, so that's how we get to $30,000 in cash flow. Remember, this is a payback. So we're looking at net annual cash inflow. When we get to our next one, which is the simple rate of return, we'll see that we're not looking at cash flow anymore, but we're looking at accounting profit. We're still working with cash flow, so we must make sure that depreciation, which is a non-cash expense, is actually added back to whatever measure we have. That's all we just want to be sure of. So. Uh, what is the investment required? Well, the investment is 80000 less any salvage value that we could get that will lower our price. So we're really only spending another $75,000, right? And uh, what is our annual cash flows? $30,000. 75 divided by 30 is 2.5 years. If you're uh, looking at this saying that's, that's kind of juvenile and naive, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's... Uh, uh, we bring it up only because, well, you may be in a small business and it may not be worth going through the net present value analysis of something. This may be sufficient to say, well, the payback is 2.2 years or 1.8 years. That's good enough for me. That, you know, you might be in that situation where you don't really need a lot of precision. Uh, and that's where it would be useful. But it's certainly not a serious, uh, a serious measure of the, uh, of the value of a project. Before we leave payback and look at simple rate of return, uh, let's ask a question. What about variable cash flows? What do we do in a, in a situation where we don't have constant cash flows for a year? Well, then we need a schedule. Rather than just a formula, we have to use a schedule. So let's say that we're going to spend $10,000 and it'll produce six years of cash flows that look like this, variable cash flows. There are two ways to do this. There's a cumulative cash flow approach and there's a declining balance approach. So I'll show you how to do both. So after year one, what's our cumulative cash flow? $3,000. What's our declining balance? Well, we've recovered three of 10,000, so we have 7,000 left to recover. At the end of the second year, what's our cumulative cash flow? 5,500. And if we take 2,500 off of the 7,000, we end up with 4,500. Notice that these two will sum to 10,000 all the time. The end of year three, we have 6,500 in cumulative cash flow, and we're now down to 3,500 we have to recover. End of year four, we're at 8,500 in cumulative cash flow. We still need to recover 1,500. End of year five, we're at $10,000 in cumulative cash flow, and we've recovered everything. It has a five-year payback. If you're feeling unsatisfied with that, I don't blame you. Um, that's, again, juvenile and naive, but there it is. Finally, we'll end with the simple rate of return. And this one, again, I think is uh, rather naive, but uh, we'll, we'll use it anyways. It's also called the accounting rate of return or the unadjusted rate of return because we're no longer looking at cash flows, but we're now looking at accounting profitability, accounting measures. So I just simpled it to S sub RR, simple rate of return, rather than writing out long words all the time. SRR is our incremental operating income by taking on the project. How much will operating income increase by, which is just our incremental revenues minus our incremental expenses, divided by the initial investment. That's it. If there are no revenues associated with it, we're just replacing a machine that will save us some money per hour. Our simple rate of return will be the cost savings minus our depreciation, because remember now, <clears throat> it's accounting. So our cost savings will be on a cash basis. It'll save us $20,000 a year. But we still have to take off the depreciation to get to an accounting basis because we're now dealing with accounting numbers, not cash flow. And again, divided by the initial investment. So let's do a couple of examples rather quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I don't want to <clears throat> give it more justice than it deserves. 
Let's say that we can make an initial investment of $180,000 in a project that will increase our revenues by $90,000, but will also increase our expenses by $40,000. So we can see that we're making $50,000 in incremental operating income on this. Uh, well, incremental EBITDA. Let me say that first. Um, it has a nine-year useful life. So that means depreciation is $20,000. Our incremental expenses were only forty. dollars uh, that's a cash expense. We want to get to an accounting expense. We have to account for this depreciation as well. So how would we do it? It is our incremental operating income, which is our incremental revenues minus our incremental expense. Incremental revenue is 90K. Incremental expense is minus 40K minus the other 20K for depreciation. We have to make sure we take depreciation off. So it's 90 minus 60. Our initial investment is 180. So it's 60 uh, over uh, uh, sorry, 90 minus 60 is 30 over 180. I've just gotten rid of all the zeros equals 16.7 percent. That's called a simple rate of return, 16.7 percent. It 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 just tells you in year one, if we look at it that way, this is just what we would expect in the first year. It just tells you what the rate of return is in the first year. It doesn't tell you how long it's going to take you to get your money back, nor does it give you any idea if it's net present value positive or negative. Um, it doesn't say, it doesn't tell you anything like that. It's just a nice, easy, quick way to look at a simple rate of return. Say it's 16.7. If it costs us 12% to finance this project, it makes sense. That's it. It's just a fast way to do it. If we look in terms of uh, purchasing a, a new piece of equipment, let's say that we spend $90,000 on a new piece of equipment. The old equipment we can sell for $2,500. This new equipment has a useful life of 15 years. 90 divided by 15 means we're going to see $6,000 in depreciation every year, but it's going to save us twenty grand a year. Uh, our simple rate of return is the $20,000 it will save us minus the depreciation because we don't care about cash flow here. It's, it's accounting income divided by our investment, which is 90,000. But we, we do subtract the 2,500 that we get for salvage value. So we'll get 14K over 87.5K, which will give us 16%. So simple rate of return is rather easy. All we have to do is remember we're dividing something by the initial investment and it's just one year of either op incremental operating income, not cash flow, operating income, or one year of incremental cost savings, but not including depreciation. We're going to treat depreciation as if it were cash uh, uh, because we're really looking at the accounting savings uh, that, that would report to shareholders and not the cash savings. Their simple rate of return, that wraps up the chapter. Thank you